In the 1740s, a boy was born by the name of Alawara Equiano in a village in what is today southeastern Nigeria. Details of his early life are vague, and even his birth location has been disputed by scholars. But his accounts, written in his later years, give a fascinating and significant insight into the complex world of slavery. When Equiano was just 11 years old, he and his sister were kidnapped whilst at home. They then went on to be separated and sold to local slave traders. Equiano was sold from owner to owner, travelling through different villages for around six months until finally he reached the West African coastline. This is where his story begins. The first object which saluted my eyes when I arrived on the coast was the sea and a slave ship which was then riding its anchor and waiting for its cargo. These filled me with astonishment, which was soon converted into terror when I was carried on board. I was now persuaded that I had gotten into a world of bad spirits and that they were going to kill me. I was soon put under the decks and there I received such a salutation in my nostrils as I had never experienced in my life, so that the loathsomeness of the stench and crying together, I became so sick and low that I was not able to eat, nor had I the least desire to taste anything. I now wished for the last friend, death, to relieve me. But soon, to my grief, two of the white men offered me edibles, and, on my refusing to eat, one of them held me fast by the hands and laid me across, I think the windlass, and tied my feet, while the other one flogged me severely. I had never experienced anything of this kind before, and although, not being used to the water, I naturally feared the element the first time I saw it. Yet, nevertheless, could I have gotten over the nettings, I would have jumped over the side. But I could not, and besides, the crew used to watch us very closely, who were not chained down to the decks, lest we should leap into the water. And I have seen some of these poor African prisoners most severely cut for attempting to do so, and hourly whipped for not eating. This indeed was often the case with myself. In a little time after, amongst the poor chained men, I found some of my own nation, which in a small degree gave ease to my mind. I inquired of them what was to be done with us. They gave me to understand that we were to be carried to these white people's country to work for them. I then was a little revived and thought if it were no worse than working, my situation was not so desperate. But I still feared I should be put to death. The white people looked and acted, as I thought, in so savage a manner, for I had never seen among any people such instances of brutal cruelty. And this not only shown towards us blacks, but also to some of the whites themselves. One man in particular I saw, when we were permitted to be on deck, flogged so unmercifully that he died in consequence of it and they tossed him over the side as they would have done a brute. At last, when the ship had gotten all her cargo, they made ready, and we were all put under the deck. The stench of the hold, while we were on the coast, was so intolerably loathsome that it was dangerous to remain there for any time, and some of us had been permitted to stay on the deck for fresh air. But now that the whole ship's cargo were confined together, it became absolutely pestilential. The closeness of the place and the heat of the climate added to the number in the ship, which was so crowded that each of us had scarcely room to turn himself, almost suffocating us. This produced copious perspirations, so that the air soon became unfit for respiration from a variety of loathsome smells, and brought on a sickness among the slaves, of which many died. Thus, falling victims to the improvident avarice of their purchases. This wretched situation was again aggravated by galling of the chains, now become insupportable, and the filth of the necessary tubs, into which the children often fell, and were almost suffocated. The shrieks of the women and the groans of the dying rendered the whole a scene of horror, almost inconceivable. Happily, perhaps for myself, I was soon reduced so low here that it was thought necessary 
to keep me almost always on deck. And, from my extreme youth, I was not put in fetters. In this situation, I expected every hour to share the fate of my companions, some of whom were almost daily brought upon deck at the point of death, which I began to hope would soon put an end to my miseries. One day, two of my wearied countrymen, who were chained together, preferring death to such a life of misery, somehow made through the nettings and jumped into the sea. Immediately, another quite dejected fellow, who, on account of his illness, was suffered to be out of his irons, also followed their example, and I believe many more would have done the same if they had not been prevented by the ship's crew, who were instantly alarmed. Those of us that were the most active were, in a moment, put down under the deck, and there was such noise and confusion amongst the people of the ship as I had never heard before, to stop her and get the boat out to go after the slaves. However, two of the wretches were drowned, but they got the other and afterwards flogged him unmercifully for thus attempting to prefer death to slavery. In this manner, we continued to undergo more hardships than I can now relate. Hardships which are inseparable from this accursed trade. Equiano survived the trip across the Atlantic and arrived on the island of Barbados in the British West Indies in the year 1754. He was then transported to the colony of Virginia to be put on the slave market, and this is where his life took an interesting turn. We'll continue his story in a future episode.